Welcome to the bilge pumps, where a bunch of drips start ship. This wasn't the only action of Toronto. No. There was something else going on which has pretty much faded into the shadows of history. Like much of the other operations going around uh, around Taranto at this point, because there are many people who I talk to who think Taranto was literally the only operation going on was the attack on Taranto, when it, as we've already been, is one of many operations going on because that's how Cunningham likes to run things. So the cruiser escort and two of the tribals didn't stop when Illustrious decided to hold station and launch its um, aircraft. Can you tell us a bit more about this one, Doctor Quack? Well, they decide to go on and uh, they decide to keep looking because, you know, their job is to go up to what is a regular Italian convoy route. It's been monitored. It's been spotted. And about 1 a.m., they turn around officially. Well, unofficially, they, they are actually uh, just, they're, they're, just as a bit more context here. Just as a little bit of context here. This is where? In the Adriatic. So what is the Adriatic? It's basically the Italians' back uh, back garden. It's their English. It's not their English Channel. It's their Irish Sea. It's their. If there is any part of the world which you can actually call Mare Nostrum, that the Italians can actually claim actually exists, rather than just being something which Il Duce is claiming, it's the Adriatic. And the British do love to go there. So it's a bit like say the Kriegsmarine sending a bunch of cruisers into the North Sea and roughly and head, head off down towards uh, the channel to see what they can find. Mm, no, it's pretty. worse than that. It is the Irish Sea. It's coming in. It's not a, they're not even it, it, it's not a case of they're around one side. No, no, no. It's they've gone right inside. They've gone. They're, they're right. heading towards Mersey and Liverpool uh, to um, to the River Mersey and Liverpool and the Wirral and that area. They are heading really for what Britain thinks is not just its zone, but why is anyone else here? Area in that sort of scenario, and it's the same with the Italians and Adriatic. You, you often like to talk about um, how Britain's cruiser and super destroyer force was designed for um, trade warfare. I guess this is the epitome of that mission. Uh, this a uh, force X certainly does show this one because um, they're supposed to turn around at 1 a.m. They're all a little bit slow in turning around at 1 a.m. And the tribals are particularly slow in turning around at 1 a.m. And HMS Mohawk Spot some darkened ships and goes hello. At which I... point they start the traditional we're going to edge closer, we're going to split up into hunting pairs, and we're going to see how much closer we can get. And they do. And then they painted British methodology of um, target location by a fire, i.e., Instead of you is necessarily flying illumination on all sorts of things to light up your target and then engage, you fire 4.7 inch rounds at your target. They hit and explode, which creates a nice target shape for your cruisers to fire their six inch guns at. And uh, this results in the loss of four merchant ships, uh, a torpedo boat badly damaged and ram free unharmed but that's mainly because it manages to somehow it avoid the fight it just doesn't seem to realize it's going on and which is a bit, Force which X, is a bit of a sh bit of a shame for an armed merchant cruiser that's supposed to be um escorting a convoy yes it's it's absolutely terrible that that armed merchant cruiser which would have been completely outclassed by the fight <laughs> and could have been beaten up by anything there managed to not notice what was going on. Um, I'm sure there was nothing like those cruisers, uh, those particular heavy cruisers at Taranto going on here. And Force X are unharmed. Uh, they do believe a torpedo passed directly under HMS Sydney, which of course is a, a very, it's a very much an Australian Amphion class uh, cruiser, which is very, very happy to see targets and is as, equally predisposed to them as the tribal class destroyers. 
But really, the whole thing is not a good experience for the Italians and is in many ways a precursor of what Force K will be getting up to later in the war. So I, I just imagine that you know this is a, a worst case scenario for the Italian fleet really, isn't it? Um, not only has their harbour been attacked, not only have they had some of their best and most powerful warships taken out of the fight for a considerable time. Not only have they lost a lot of their precious fuel, they've had their holy ground, this their, their sacred um, seaway violated by this cruiser force. To be honest, the so, only way the British, uh, British could have embarrassed Mussolini more in terms of naval power at this point is if one of the swordfish had managed to land outside his palace, the crew gone in, stripped him naked, whacked his butt, and called him a naughty boy, taking photos of it, and then run out. That is literally the only way you could have embarrassed <laughs> Il Duce more over this scenario. Because like it's, like one thing, the it's one thing attacking a fleet. And you have to remember, that stuff is also going on at this point as well. There are raids going on on the coast and various other things of SBS from submarines um especially the u-boat uh, the u-class vessels of flotilla attempt submarine flotilla operating out of malta but the thing is this is holy ground in terms of sea frank for the uh, for the italians and so you beat up okay they get them back in service several of them yes and they manage to repair the damage and they get them back serving but you can't recover the oil. But more importantly, you've just had your fleet attacked in their supposedly safe harbour. And you, what have you got to show from it? We've shot down maybe two aircraft. That doesn't really look good. And then, OK, and what did the British do? At the time? Did they settle themselves with just doing that? No. They also decided to, while your fleet was getting beaten up in harbour, not rather than being out at sea protecting your waterways they go into your adriatic your great sea and beat up a convoy it's to be honest cunningham is waging cunningham is doing a psychological warfare he's also taking, he's taking a big risk he's also taking a big risk you know yeah, he's taking big risks, but they're paying off. They're, it's establishing a level of dominance over the Italians. That's what he's seeking to do. He's seeking to make them question everything from that moment onwards. Because from that moment onwards, if you're Italians and you see an operation is over and you think this operation is done, can you trust that it's done? Or are you going to start looking over your shoulder going, well, we've seen a convoy go down there, but can we trust it's just about a convoy? And when the big convoys come on, you see the big fleets taking the convoys to Malta. There has got to be part of the Italian strategic command constantly thinking for the rest of the war. Are we seeing a convoy operation or is something else bigger happening? Yeah. And it starts to explain how conservative they get in some of their operations, their deployment of things, because there's constant fear of them going through their minds of what are the British really doing? And it's it's also about taking advantage of the actual attack on Taranto itself, because if you were to, in other circumstances, if you were to sail a force into the Adriatic and start shooting at convoys, you would, for all the reasons we've just discussed, initiate a crash deployment of the fleet from Taranto to make sure that whoever had dared do that didn't survive the experience. But by hitting Taranto at the same time, it means the bulk of the Italian fleet has other things on its mind, which means you can also pull that off and all the other operations as well, because everyone's distracted. You don't the Italians don't know where to go. It's do, do we respond to these attacks out on on our our shipping and our convoys out at sea? Do we do we strengthen our defenses at Taranto? Do we redeploy what's left of our fleet at Taranto away from Taranto? Um, and all of these things are mutually exclusive options which then and means that as long as you've, you're the one who's initiated the operation, by the time the Italians have figured out what it is they're actually going to be doing, you have already got long gone. And to be honest, I would reckon actually Cunningham's got another layer to this plan, because I reckon there's part of him that thinks that A, he'll damage some ships, but he's not sure if he'll take them out completely at Toronto. Uh, 
But he's thinking the Adriatic operation that the Italians will be forced, if they are able, to deploy a fleet to try and intercept them. And then he's got four say, and he's got a carrier as well. So he's got four say. He's got his own battleships there. So while they, if they deploy whatever they can from Toronto to intercept Force X, well, it's going to probably it's going to run into Force A. Force A running into a partial Italian fleet is a very successful scenario for Cunningham, more than likely. Is visually at night. Yeah, and that's the thing. <sighs> that's what he wants. He wants the reaction. He wants the the Toronto to weaken their force. And he then wants the Italians to react out of anger, out of emotion, without thinking. And you have to actually say this, say this is him almost underestimating Italians, because, or may, uh, maybe underestimating Italians, because they don't. Or maybe the damage done at Toronto is actually just too much for it to, uh, them to actually deploy, because they don't deploy anything. They don't deploy heavy cruisers. They don't send a heavy cruiser striking force or anything, because if they had done that... Force A would have gobbled them up very happily. And we've because... also got... I was going to say, we've also got to bear in mind that um, initially they wanted to follow up with a second attack the following night. Mm. Before we get to that, though, I mean, mm. Illustrious and the cruisers have to sprint from the site because mm -hmm. it's you know, after one o'clock in the morning. Um, so at 28 knots, they head south. Um, no, the, the thing is, nobody knew how successful the raid was beyond the fact that they sent X number of aircraft out and all but two of them returned. So, you know, while pilots said, oh, look, I think I might have hit something, um, the, the fact is, is that by the time it took for the torpedo to be dropped in the water for it to hit its target, by that time, the swordfish is already undertaking wild manoeuvres to try and get the hell out of there. So it's very hard for the pilots and observers to know what's going on, yet alone know whether it was their torpedo which hit a ship. They could only report exact times or whatever that they did things and what they were aiming at when, in what sort of sequence of events. So they're racing south. They're waiting for um that RAF re reconnaissance flight to pass over in the morning and hopefully this time take less than 24 hours to forward it to the fleet to actually find out whether the raid had been a success and whether a follow-up raid was necessary um once again there's a discrepancy here between uh what is in the official accounts and is what is in the um uh, autobiographies, the pilots and, and um, observers were aghast at the idea that they'd be sent in again because, you know, they'd just flown into Mount Etna, basically, and they didn't really want to do it again. Um, they thought that they'd used up all their luck. The the idea coming from higher up the chain was, yes, we would like to do this again to make sure that we've done as much damage as we can. Somewhere along the line, somebody decides that the weather is too harsh. <clears throat> I'm not really sure that matches up with the weather forecast at the time. But I think what happened is, is that uh, Admiral Lister, um, after he got the reports of or the photos clearly showing battleships beached, oil everywhere, that he felt that I'm going to intervene on behalf of my pilots and fudge the weather report a little bit <laughs> so that they don't have to um, throw themselves, you know, into a very well-prepared and probably very, very angry bunch of Italian gunners who are not really going to care too much about um, whether or not they hit those beached battleships or not. The other thing to bear in mind as well is that the Italians responded to the attack commendably quickly. They realised that Taranto was no longer safe. So 
the ships that they had that were still intact and mobile, like Vittorio Veneto, were all moved to Napoli uh, the yeah. following day. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. if the second attack had gone in, they would have only found, well, they would have found the ships they'd already hit, so Cavour, Latorio, etc. So there's possibly, there, there, I mean, there's certainly an argument they could have either extended the time needed to repair them or possibly knock them out of the war completely but um it it would have probably been not worth it overall a if, point of if, diminished returns yeah if i think if the italian if the italians hadn't moved veneto and other and other ships then it, that point it might have been worth going for it because if you can take out all the italian capital ships for several months that changes the equation massively but when you're effectively just adding on to what you've already done uh, pr probably keep your pilots for another opportunity you see the real difference would have been if they had gone with the idea which was considered at some points earlier which would have been a sort of Merzel Kabir run in again where the force A battleships get within range uh, after the strikes and then start fi fire a few salvos into Toronto into the harbor before withdrawing mm. and if they'd yeah. done that that would have been were that could well have uh, on the night of the attacks if that'd been done on the night of the attacks that could have caused quite a big reaction uh, the, 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 but it also if, would have meant you'd have been if, running in a lot of air more air, air attacks probably yes. the next day. I, I was going to say the what if there is that you would need faster battleships. Because mm. you would be dealing with a lot of firepower mm. the next day. I, I mean, think... I kind of given given how how little torpedo netting there was. I mean, obviously they didn't know that initially, but we obviously after the recon flights and the attack itself, um, the relative lack of torpedo netting what was apparent. I almost wonder if they, if if they brought in. I know the T class generally didn't do too well in the Mediterranean because of the shallow nature of, and clear nature of the water and their fairly large size. But you, it may have been worth trying to bring in two or three T class subs and have them sneak in at night concurrent with the attack, because at that point. If you let's say got three T class, if they get in close enough, the Italians are distracted. They're not exactly going to be focused on nighttime anti-submarine warfare while there's an air attack going on. Lob thirty torpedoes into the harbour, you'll probably hit something. Actually, uh, I'm more surprised there wasn't an ambush arranged the next day. I'm surprised there weren't either a couple of U class vessels or even some T class vessels sitting off the harbour waiting for those ships to leave. It, it depends because on. If, Availability, doesn't it? They might have been trying to interdict other things or, you know. Well, I, I, I can accept that, that, yes, but I also think how many targets are more important or more useful than possibly taking out the re remainder of the Italian battle fleet? Because let's put it this way, if you even take out one battleship in the entrance to Taranto as it's coming out, before it gets mm. out, blocking the entrance, so blocking the rest in there, You've then done how much damage to them? You know, y y you've basically taken out the Italian fleet. So the point from this point, though, the, the comes the argument of how effective was the attack. So we've got three battleships here, either resting on the on the mud or sunk. One of which is deemed to be a economic loss, meaning that they could repair it, but they didn't consider it to be worth the effort. And the other two were pretty much repaired by May, you know, a few months later. They weren't out of action for long. Um, but it did take a lot of effort for a country that was struggling, shall we say, in a building up its stockpile of resources and uh, it's a manufacturing capacity under wartime conditions. You know, repairing the, those holes in the size, size of those battleships <coughs> would not have been easy by any means. Um, replacing the, the, its equipment wouldn't have been easy. But at the same time, though, is 
Yes, it, it wasn't like a lot of the ships in Pearl Harbor, which took several years to to refloat or to, to rebuild, for example. But um, the point is, is that, as you said, the day after they abandoned their forward base, never to really use it for anything bigger than a cruiser again. Um, I'm sure that anyone who had been aboard any of those battleships at that point would not have wanted to be on the receiving end of a torpedo again. And I'm sure that any admiral that had experienced that would not really have wanted to be blamed for <laughs> such damage again. So I don't know. I mean, what are your thoughts on the actual physical achievement here? Well, I think the, the the main thing is it breaks the momentum because up until this point, you've got relatively you've got actions that have relatively scored draws, um, and you've also got the potential for the Italians actually gaining an ascendancy in the Mediterranean because Vittorio Veneto has not been in service all that long at the time of Taranto, having Littorio alone was a bit of a problem for the Royal Navy because whilst something like Warspike could probably give her a good fair fight as long as they stayed in range, as long as she could get into range, the Italians did have very accurate, very long range gunnery and the Littorios had the high speed over the Queen Elizabeth's to keep the, that range open, which if it wasn't for the fact Italian shell quality control was completely abysmal, could have been a ma major problem. And even then, they occasionally did have a good run of shells. And so if you've got two of those, you can see in all the fleet movements up until that point, uh, both Cunningham with the Mediterranean fleet and Force H coming the other way, they're forced to keep together and operate as a single unit, which limits the what they can do. Whereas once Taranto happens, the Italians, half of their capital ships are out of action now. The other half are a lot more scared about coming out. And because of that reduction in force potential, it means that Cunningham's next operations, he doesn't have to use the entire fleet. He can break the fleet up into doing multiple different operations, which means he's getting more accomplished and he can hit the Italians in more places, which just exacerbates their problems because now they've got fewer ships to respond to more incidents at the same time, which puts them on the back foot for a good while. And obviously that helps, that helps the situation in the Mediterranean quite a bit. Uh, or later on, obviously you get things like Matapan, which further reduced the Italian fleet numbers, but it, it, I think it's, it's one of those key turning points because after that you start to see a lot more decisive actions in the Mediterranean where there is a definitive winner. There are still a few areas where it's kind of a score draw or, or, uh, Italian victory in some of the smaller skirmish engagements, but by and large, the the combat in the Mediterranean moves to there being fairly easy to draw a line and say this this side or the other has won, and it's usually the Royal Navy or and the, and the Royal Australian Navy who come out on top after that, um, because once even once Littorio is back in service, um, I think it's Cavour never never comes back into service. Yeah. So they're they, permanently. They don't. They don't. They, don't uh, when they, they, they do refloat her, mm. but they decide that it's just not worth the effort of yeah. um, getting yeah. back up to operation. So, the, yeah. so they're permanently down one battleship, and by the time Littorio is back into service, Veneto's basically had to carry the entire Italian capital ship effort, which means that you now get into this cycle of one ship is available and the other isn't, which, because they're refitting or 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 repairing. And that, in turn, further extends the effect of Taranto. You don't see Littorio and Vittorio Veneto come out together much after this point. Um, and ironically enough, they get they just about get to the point where they could probably deploy both of them and Roma just in time for, the, for Italy's part in the war to end. Mm. The, the, the thing about this attack is mm. that the British lost two swordfish and two aircrew. The losses amongst the Italians weren't all that awful either. Um, Vittorio lost 23 crew, uh, 16 were lost on the Cavour, and only one 
um, aboard the Yulia. So um, death toll nowhere near as bad as uh, Pearl Harbor. Hmm. Yeah, well, I think I think a lot of that is reflected in the fact that when the Italian ships, I mean, that there's not the level bombing and well, level bombing dash dive bombing effort to quite the same extent that there is at Pearl Harbor, and also when the Italian ships sink or ground, they tend to just kind of gradually settle which is relatively speaking easier to get out of as opposed to if you look at if you look at Pearl Harbor where US ships do settle like Nevada there's not that many casualties the big casualty events are places like Oklahoma which rolls over or Arizona or Arizona which explodes that's where those big casualty events happen and it just doesn't happen for the Italians um, which to is probably fortunate it's the, it's the depth of the harbor as well which mm. allows that to an extent the also, Italian but, harbour, especially where the ships are in in in, in sort of in Taranto, it's not really deep enough for them to. And this sounds funny. Before a ship rolls, it tends to sink a bit anyway. And the trouble is, the bit they sink is enough to get them on the bottom, so they're not going to roll. It's and, very and so, rare a ship does while still at the same level does a flip. And and some of it, to be honest, is also pure luck because all almost all of the hits that the Italian ships suffer are either in the front third or the rear third. And of those, quite a lot of them are actually quite extremely towards the bow or stern, which obviously the bow and the stern don't have quite as much buoyancy as the as a midship. So they just tend to kind of just drop into the ocean. Whereas, again, when you look at some of the US ships that are hit at Pearl Harbor, like Oklahoma is mostly hit amidships. And that's where the greatest beam is. So therefore, that's where the greatest effect on the stability mm -hmm. is going to be. And then it lists and rolls over. And and I mean, a certain amount of credit. It's one of these things, actually, weirdly enough, with the Pugliese torpedo defense system, where it's a little bit of a swings and roundabout system, because ultimately the Swordfish's torpedoes, they are 18 inch aerial torpedoes. They're not 21 or 24 inch surface or submarine launch torpedoes so they're not they don't quite have the same bang as some other uh, torpedoes in the war but although some of the hits are beyond the defense system especially when you look at Littorio the it does take a hit um, abreast of a turret and Yes, the torpedo defense system is slightly thinner there because of design compromises they've had to make to get the speed of the ship up. But it does fail to an 18-inch torpedo, um, which doesn't really bode well for what might have happened to that ship or ships of its class had it been hit in roughly the same position by a 21-inch or 24-inch surface launch torpedo or submarine launch torpedo. Um but at the same time, although the torpedo defense system fails and the ship takes on enough water to, to nose down into the mud, it takes on water at a rate and in a manner such that, as we said, it doesn't roll. The flooding is relatively even. <laughs> um, mm. uh, I, I guess also we've also got to remember that these ships are at war. Mm. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not... They're not um, Completely. They're not as closed up. They're not um, expecting. It's, it's going to sound strange. They're, and they do have those. Whilst we can talk about, we did make some points about the fact that keep being on full operation and full this, it does have a wear on the crew. And there are probably people who are, let's say, not quite fulfilling their duties at 100% after weeks of doing this. But they are at war. They will have the ship closed up. They will have certain things in place. All these things there, it's not like Pearl Harbor, which is, well, Taranto has, as I said, not strategic surprise, but does have tactical surprise. In that the Italians weren't expecting them to, they didn't, they, they thought their place would be attacked. They weren't expecting the attack that day. Pearl Harbor well, gets both strategic and tactical surprise. Yeah. In that they're not uh, they're not expecting you to attack at all, and they're certainly not expecting, mm. expecting to be attacked that day. Well, yeah, and there's, and let's say the, the Littorio is a modern ship, mm. and Cavour and the other older Italian ships there have been thoroughly modernised to an extent that probably isn't matched, to, with the exception of Queen Elizabeth Valiant and Renown. 
Um, and for better or worse, at Pearl Harbor, the US standard class have been through some minimal modernizations in the interwar period, but they're nowhere near as modernized as as the, those other as the Italian ships and some of the British ships are. Although obviously a lot of them do get basically rebuilt <laughs> as a result afterwards. Mm. So their, their their defense systems are not going to be quite as as up to spec, just generally on that point. Let alone some of the uh, existing weaknesses that were noted uh, in some design reports. So this brings us to the tale of the two lieutenant commanders. We've already mentioned uh, Lieutenant Commander John Ovi the Third, the mm -hmm. U.S. Navy uh, observer. Um, but within days of the attack. A Japanese lieutenant commander, uh, lieutenant commander Neto, was rushed from Berlin to Italy, and his orders were to learn everything he could about the attack on Toronto. I wonder why that was the case. <laughs> well, it makes sense, but also it, it's going to sound strange. It's because uh, everyone's been practicing this and theorizing about this and working on developing this. And the British have gone and done it. And the British haven't just done it once. Because we think of Taranto as Taranto as the big thing. But honestly, Merzel Kabir is kind of a run of it, but the British don't re do the torpedo attack. And they do it sort of at daytime because of that scenario of Merzel Kabir. But that also does factor experience from there. In fact, sort of thing does factor into how the British do Taranto in a limited extent, in that it shows what certain things have already been revealed by exercising in the interwar here. And also, the fact is the it, the Japanese and the Americans both realise that the British have been doing something which they haven't been as able to do. The British have been doing these humongous exercises in the interwar years, and remember. The British had the largest fleet of carriers, had the la often the largest fleet on, in reality of available ships in the interwar years, because whilst the Americans on paper could build up to the same as the British, thanks to the US Senate and Congress and various things, they very rarely had the same number of ships as they were allowed. They were promised a Navy second to none. They talked about having a Navy second to none. No one funded a Navy second to none until there was actually a world war going on. So the British had done, so in many ways, this is the British and the, uh, the Japanese who don't have someone on the British aircraft carrier, like the Americans do, trying to learn about the British developments and the British understanding of this for two reasons. One, it's for their own plan of attacks coming up. But also, and you have to think about this, the British are also potentially people who are going to be attacking the Japanese. It makes sense for the Japanese to want to know what the British capabilities are, what the British could do to them, because the Japanese have got to be thinking about this, because mm -hmm. if they're going to go to war with America and Britain, you've got to think about not only what you're going to maybe do in Pearl Harbor, but also what you're possibly going to have done to you. And look, at some point, I also believe that Japan got its hands on Italy's, um, uh, I think they had a timber tail adapter for tor air launch torpedoes to make them run shallow. Yeah. A sort of a, a box shaped kind of um, contraption. It, they used that, which sort of fell off once the torpedo hit the water uh, to keep it from diving too deep. Um, which I think is fairly similar to the what the Japanese eventually used. And uh, also what the British had fitted as part of their system. It was part of their system to their torpedoes. The British did have these things as part of the system. It's just no one realised what all these extra wires and ca the, all these extra cables, tension wires, in the water were for. There were all these wire, the wire, there were so many wires from so many things, no one noticed any extra lengths of wire. They noticed these strange bits of wood which they thought were fins, and they worked out probably were fins, but they didn't notice the wires. Of course they're not going to notice the wires. There's wires from balloons, there's wires from ships, there's cables all over the freaking place. No one's going to notice them. 
The only ones who know them, uh, know them are the British who know what they were looking for. And here's the other thing I would like to point out for uh, John Opie. His report doesn't mention tension wires from when I read uh, from when mm. I read it. This is my memory. I don't think he was told about it. Or he might not have noticed that he was. I don't think he was. No, exactly, because it, he was yeah. probably wandering around. But also, unless someone points it out to you, suppose, you're probably yeah. not going to realize what it is. And none of the British are pointing out to them. Now, I don't think the British are thinking about a war with America at this particular point, because that would be really, 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 <laughs> really really bad it didn't get but Churchill upset. there's also there is a point you start to think are are the british doing this because they're worried about operational security because they know america isn't at war yet so they're worried if they're sharing the information the mm. information water out they might not be as secure and understanding half the system is one thing that's the visible uh, the highly visible one but the other bit unless he actually asks well we didn't tell him he didn't ask it's not a. It's a case of it keeps it quiet and stops it going around the American communications, which might be intercepted by the Germans. Hedging your bets. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, look, the, the Japanese were certainly extremely keen to learn what they could. So, this lieutenant commander who was sent down within days, um, he fired off a encrypted report to Yamamoto, but he was also actually recalled to Tokyo to personally brief um, Commander Fuchida, the leader of the, the Pearl Harbor strike. So it, it went, that's how close, but that, that's the degree of interest that the Japanese paid in that um, in the strike. They followed it up with a second delegation, a, a full delegation, this time not just the, the emergency response lieutenant commander, um, who arrived in Italy in May, and it was their job was to go over all of the details about the damage to the battleships, inspect the battleships and personally interview the um, key commanders, key fire control officers of Toronto and uh, the ships involved. Again, they wanted to learn about what it was like on the receiving end of the raid they were planning in order to either exploit any weaknesses they found or optimize any um, chances of, of doing damage that they could find. Whereas Opie, of course, he did the opposite. His job was, you know, um, to pass on lessons of the attack to um, the US Navy. He was there in uh, at, during every phase of the operation. He was there in the briefing room as the pilots were briefed on their mission. He saw the, you know, the, 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 the photographs. He saw the the mud maps where and when each aircraft uh, was supposed to be at what time. He was in the hangar as the aircraft were being prepared. So, yeah, it, 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 you're probably right. Either they had the torpedoes already slung or he just didn't pay any attention or didn't realise its, its significance. Um, but he was also there as the pilots all landed and were having their um, eggs, swordfish, cake and whiskey. <clears throat> so he got the full story. He wrote a, 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 he initially wrote a five page summary basically of what he saw um, with some dot point recommendations. And he also forwarded um, Illustrious Captain's official report of the action as well to um, back to Washington. But he followed that up with personal contacts, um, further documentation, and one of those context was a specific request to go to Pearl Harbor to discuss with the commanders there how to improve his defenses in light of what he'd seen. That request was turned down and while his report was sent to just about everybody of any note within the USN, no one really bothered to pay any attention to it. So yeah, look, here's a, a real missed opportunity, I suspect. You know, um, at the very least, they should have come away with the um, dispelled illusion that Pearl Harbor was too shallow for a torpedo attack, at the very, very least. Uh, well, 
missed opportunities. It's... Politics. Mm -hmm. um, because I think the actual admiral in charge of Pearl Harbor about that time, um, up around about January of that year, January 1941, um, wrote a similar report back to Washington saying, I really, really need to improve my defences. I really, really need to improve my defences. And the response was, you're fired. So, um, yeah, I guess the Congress, Senate budget considerations were a little bit too much of a consideration there somehow, maybe. I don't know. I, it's something that I haven't uh, delved into in great depth, but I know the US Navy spent an awful lot of time uh, got running um, investigations into what happened at Pearl Harbor. Yeah. I haven't read that report, and I don't know. It would be interesting to see whether OP features very strongly in it. It's one of the interesting things about OP is that you consider his career after this, and I, I have been doing some research on him to try and track him down, to try and track down exactly, you know, what he does, where he does it. And he's, all, he's sent as, first off, he goes to USN, uh, USS Roe, which is a, a um, just to get my notes up, is a Sims class destroyer. And then he goes to a Fletcher class. And he serves on her. To, he's the commissioning commander of USS Bunch, Batch, B A C H E, Batch. I'm not sure. Bake. Uh, <laughs> Bake? Uh, I'm not sure. And um, he's on her till January 1943. And then he sort of seems to disappear. I can't really find much from after 1943. And. I don't know what happens to him, um, you know, what he does. It's one of those things where you would think an officer who goes and does this, I am not going to be sending one of my less intelligent, less capable officers to go do this report. He also seems to be, from where all this email, this stuff goes, to be quite connected. And he was right, which tends to mean that post after you've been found out to be right everyone suddenly wants to be your friend and promote you in my experience of dealing with these organizations so i'm rather surprised if he just does end up as a captain and ends up leaving the service in 1943 so i i sort of would be really interested in tracking down that story because i said in all my research i can't find opie anyway i guess here we come to that comparison point what is you know can you compare Toronto with Pearl Harbor? Well, the Royal Navy, if they had 355 aircraft, would have been absolutely in clover. I mean, if they'd had an attack force of 355 aircraft, I doubt that, and considering the, what they achieved with 21, I doubt there would have been a Italian ship left afloat after it had been over. Uh, and that's not me overstating. That's just considering the uh, what the damage they caused with 21, then times that by, let's see, roughly, uh, ooh, uh, oh, let's be generous and just go for times 17 or times 16. You know, if you could, if you're saying that you're going to, you've got 16 <coughs> times that number of aircraft, you cause this much damage. You're probably going to cause a fair bit more. Let's say the drop of the capability, the percentage of success drops down to less. They have less targets. You know, it, it would have been very interesting. So, but, it, 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 so there is so much that's the same. There's also so much that's different. So as we've already established, um, Britain and Italy were already at war and had been so for several months. The Royal Navy fleet air arm attacked at night. The, the Imperial Navy waited for dawn. That's one of the questions I do think. Imagine if the Imperial Navy had been able to attack at night, i.e. Saturday night uh, or very early Sunday morning when everyone was getting back from drinking and had got back and were in their beds and after a Saturday night partying and everyone was in their beds and all those things. Sunday morning at dawn, it was bad enough. There were enough people... But if you manage to count that attack back 
two, three hours, let's say, into the darkness, imagine the relative damage done to the Americans if they had been caught not only unprepared, but at night. The confusion that would have been added to it. Would they really have, would the confusion have added to the um, Americans or would it have added to the Japanese? Because it, this is a su complete surprise attack. This is a strategic surprise, as you said. So, you know, we've got that situation of darkened ships against a darkened harbour. No, uh, I don't think it would have been so, darkened ships. I think the Americans would have turned on their searchlights. Don't know. Because that's the American doctrine at the time. So if they turn on their searchlights and then you've got searchlights turned on at night, they have a very similar scenario with Taranto in terms of their air defense things up. Yes, they have the freedom, as Brack says, because they can, you know, their, their ships can actually lower their guns and fire without risk of hitting each other. But then you also have the scenario, they're all in a nice line. And if any, even one or two of them turn on their searchlights, even one or two of them are commanded by officers who aren't really thinking or who aren't experienced enough to go against rules and guidelines. And, and it'd be easier, easier to drop a row of flares over the top of them as opposed to mm, battleships yeah. scattered through the whole harbour. So. Yeah, and, and to, be, to be honest, I think the other thing is, as we mentioned before, um, if the in the in the event of a battleship row style scenario, more torpedoes are going to strike home because the ones that might go slightly off course from one target will probably just hit the next ship in line. And it also depends on the size of the strike force. But if you look at the, obviously, the, the Pearl Harbor attack by the Japanese had fighters and dive bombers and torpedo craft. The Taranto strike force was very heavily weighted towards torpedo strike carrying aircraft, although obviously there were some bombers and a couple of flare flare droppers. So if you were talking about a similar sized strike, but with that heavier bias towards torpedo craft, okay, fair enough. It was a bomb that set off Arizona's magazines, but you'd probably see overall more more ships either more permanently put down like Oklahoma was or con considerably more heavily damaged because letting water in at the bottom tends to do a lot work more to ships than letting air in the top <laughs> and and uh, upper upper level fires because an upper level fire can disable a ship but a torpedo that rips the bottom out will sink it and sure. that's going to be a lot of damage I, mm. I, I i you cannot overstate if the japanese had been able of doing a night attack i have no doubt they would have actually done it and as i said you can't that attack back two, three hours, the damage done to the American Navy would have been even bigger. Yes, they they suffered a lot, but imagine how many of their guns, or how many of their ships have radar at this point. I So if you're attacking at night, they've got the same problems the Italians do. They have the same weapons dispositions, but they, then, they don't have those guns manned like the Italians do, and they've off been, they're still... Get, it, it's not been a few hours after the Saturday night excess because it's their normal weekend. It's almost right on top of their Saturday excess where they have just got home. They're in bed. They're sleeping. They're still sleeping off whatever they've been doing the night before very much. And they're still in there. They're not even beginning to wake up. They're not begin. They're not thinking about Sunday morning church service or anything like that. They're all in bed or wherever they're, they're in a bed. It might not well be the bed they're supposed to be as well. And, and and well and also launching in the historic Pearl Harbor attack by the time of the second wave there were fighters airborne and one one of the in the the perennial discussions over whether or not they should have launched a third wave there's always that thing about by the time the third wave arrived there would have been a lot more fighters airborne there would have been a lot more anti-aircraft guns active if an attack kicks off at two three in the morning then the second wave is probably hitting at about what, four or five in the morning um at which point if you're sending in a third wave that's probably the wave that would then be striking just after dawn and okay you might just about be getting um fighters up at that point 
but they're still going to be operating in largely sort of pre-dawn, dawn, darkness. The anti-aircraft gun is going to have the same issues. So, and the you've possibility got the damage of, the previous yeah. two waves have done. Yeah, so the possibility that a third wave would have significantly less opposition if it was following on from a night attack, and it, and may, may even if they if they got them off quick enough, may even arrive in the pre-dawn darkness, which would have most of the advantages of the night attack as well. Because uh, the, 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 the can you can you imagine the carnage that would be trying to launch fighters into the middle of that have no radar, no radar guidance, into the middle of pre-dawn? You've just about got a little bit of sunlight poking up over the mountains and hitting the clouds. You've got enemy aircraft swarming around. You've got searchlights going off. You've got anti-aircraft guns going off. No one's going to have the slightest clue where to send those fighters, and they're probably going to end up running into their own AA. Maybe we'll have to try and war game that one day. Mm. Yes, or, you know, it, 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 it's one of those scenarios. And also, you have to remember, uh, it, it's not a good scenario for the Americans in that case. Mm. But this wasn't a good scenario for the Italians. And the point is, in 1939, 1940, 1941... You're at the beginning of an age where these things are coming, are becoming available and practical as operations, but you haven't yet really got the solutions in service. And the solutions are being developed. So, uh, nice way. Please don't sit there and uh, anyone sit there and go, these technologies today, without compare, they're able to dominate all this. No, no. Radar's being developed. Okay. It's in the process at this point. There's all sorts of other things in the process at this point. Medium caliber AA guns, all these things are being developed. It's just it takes a while sometimes for the technology cycle to go around. You develop one half and then it comes around, the other half comes up and then it comes around again. And it's just a constant cycle of te technology between offensive and defensive powers. And it takes a while and it's, you know, they eventually they reach the point where the defensive firepower has too much capability and then you develop a new de technology and then it goes around again. And the point is Taranto and Pearl Harbor happen on the turning of that dial. So my personal concluding note will be just some raw statistics here. Okay. okay. Toronto, one aircraft carrier, 21 aircraft, one battleship taken out of the war, two severely damaged, one destroyer and one heavy cruiser lightly damaged, two seaplanes and their hangars destroyed. In accompanying operations, four merchant vessels sunk, one torpedo boat heavily damaged. Versus the Imperial Navy. Should you well, add in fight. also the Genoa operation? The fact that also the Malta operation, all the other things going on? Because there's a lot of operations going on around Taranto. We'll, we'll, we'll keep it simple. Okay. <laughs> um, Imperial Navy, okay, so they had six carriers. But they, they weren't doing all the things the Royal Navy was doing at the same time. They had 355 aircraft. They destroyed three battleships, severely damaged a further four, and also damaged three destroyers. I'm not sure how many aircraft they destroyed on the ground, but quite a few. Their accompanying operations lost six submarines for no real tangible effect. The actual air raids, Royal Navy lost two aircraft, Japan lost 29 aircraft. So uh, very different bases, very different fleets, very different circumstances. But in terms of your raw efficiency, um, I think it's those numbers reveal that the FAA managed to eke every last ounce of performance out of those swordfish. That they did. Any concluding observations from you two? Um, I would just go with that. T Taranto is often overlooked because of the sheer scope and scale of Pearl Harbor. And whilst the Japanese were developing their own ideas about how to attack sh uh, fleets in harbour, the, they were influenced to a certain degree by Taranto. And Taranto showed if you 
had the right tactics and you had the right training, you could leverage a very small force in the grand scheme of things to have a massively disproportionate impact on the enemy. And it's it's one of those slightly odd things that people sometimes tend to forget in that whilst, especially in World War One, the Royal Navy is very commonly viewed as a, using a sledgehammer to crack every single nut in sight. And even in World War Two, the Royal Navy is the biggest navy in the world off and on between 39 and probably mid 43. It's still using a lot of what we almost want to call sneaky tactics to try and do things like this, to leverage smaller available forces to have a disproportionate effect on the enemy. And Taranto is probably one of the greatest examples of that, because as as you said with your listing, it's like one one carrier, less than two dozen aircraft, completely affects the strategic balance of the of a major theater of war for months on end. That's a pretty good rate of return on a collection of canvas and fabric and wood. I would add you always have to remember these operations going on when you're talking about Toronto and you're talking about Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor is the principal focus of the Japanese Navy, and I'm not talking about one fleet. I'm talking the entire Navy is almost formed together to carry out what will enact this attack. On various points, they're doing movements, but to get the Kido Butai to Pearl Harbor is pretty much uses every single effort of refueling uh, that has first priority on everything across a whole fleet. The Royal Navy launches Taranto, and it's not the Royal Navy that launches it, it's the Mediterranean fleet. And it's not even the whole Mediterranean for the fleet in the Mediterranean. We're talking about the fleet which is in the Eastern Mediterranean under the command of Admiral Cunningham. The Royal Navy has multiple fleets around the world with dozens of operations going on at this point. Convoys, carriers taking part in operations, attacking various things. There's Operation EJ, I think, which is happening around this time and all sorts of other operations going on. One small attack in many respects, which is part of a whole, whole maelstrom of operations which Cunningham has going on anyway, manages to achieve this effect. It is not a full force effort. If it had been a full force effort of the fleet, then you cannot say that the British wouldn't have sent more aircraft carriers. If this had not, uh, this had been a Royal Navy attack rather than the Mediterranean fleet and the British forces in the Eastern Mediterranean attack, you cannot tell me other aircraft carriers would not have been sent if that had been their prime objective. But the thing is, the British are dealing with fighting a war. They are launching Toronto as an operation being conducted during a war when they're dealing with the commitments of a war and they achieve what they do, which is very significant for that war. Pearl Harbor has the benefits and the negatives, if you're American, of being launched when there isn't a war, when the Japanese can afford to concentrate their forces as much as they do, when they are picking and choosing their commitments, the enemy isn't getting a vote because the enemy doesn't realize he has a vote because the enemy doesn't realize he's at war. So this is the difference between Taranto and Pearl Harbor. When you start to go, well, the Japanese have managed to mass all these things for Pearl Harbor, of course they can. It's basically like the Royal Navy in September, in August 1939, launching an attack, a preemptive attack on Wilhelmshaven or something like that. They would have massed every single carrier in the Royal Navy quite happily in August 1939. You can't do that by the time you get to November 1940. So that's the real thing about Toronto versus Pearl Harbor. One is an operation of wartime. One is an operation of peacetime in many respects. Very good points. Yeah. All right. Well, fascinating talking to you guys again. Mm -hmm. I think we've looked at this from every possible available angle. Hopefully you guys have learned as much as I have, and hopefully mm -hmm. our viewers have found it to be equally interesting. It's been great.
as always. And it's going to be the first of many, I'm very sure. Because it's been a lot of fun. Is that a threat? Yes. <laughs> I think we decided, didn't we decide HMAS Sydney was going to be next? Or, or We've got uh, some ideas we'll, of different options. We've got a few ideas. We'll, we'll figure that out. We'll thrash that out in the comments later on. Yeah. <laughs> okay, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Okay. And also, they were sufficiently incentivized with whiskey and a swordfish shaped egg in a uh, swordfish shaped cake in celebration. The egg part, I'm not so sure about the eggs. Frankly, I would want bacon, sausage, baked beans, <laughs> a full breakfast. But the cake, the swordfish shaped cake, I'm quite happy to take. It would just all be mine. Mm -hmm. And the, wi the whiskey, well, I'd prefer Iron Brew, of course, as I'm sure would track. But, you know, Jamie can understand the mm. whiskey. And to some degree, it depends which one. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope wow. after that. I would hope after that flight, uh, that flight, it's a good quality whiskey, and be it's your choice. <laughs> well, look, I mean, yeah, we 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 read how the fleet air arm was fueled by um, gin and uh, whatever else they could get at their bar um, mm -hmm. for much. Of all. So yes, you know, so, so. gin, rum, whiskey, cake. Do you need anything more? The occasional traded ice cream. Mm. Snaffled from the, 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 the British, from the uh, allied also, US carriers in exchange for I, a bolt, I'm sure. Am I the only one who thinks that considering Charles Lamb went to all that trouble to get those potatoes back, why didn't potatoes feature as part of the celebration? Well, they were probably the keeping them in his locker. <laughs> some the you know, no, no, there should be some chips or something there. <laughs> That's You'd the have animal. to wake the chef up for that. <laughs> Anyway, After five or six and a half hours, I will wake the chef up. 